<laughs> Welcome to our November 2023 Abbeville Institute. John Devaney, join us today to talk about John Randolph of Roanoke. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun, but before we get started, just want to remind everyone that uh, the Abbeville Institute does exist on your generous contributions. So if you like these webinars, our website, our conferences, all, all the things that we're doing, please consider a tax deductible donation to the Institute. It is the end of the year. So if you're making your tax preparations, it's a good time to send along a donation if you're so inclined. We also have a great conference coming up. Uh, Dr. Devaney and I were just talking about it before we came on. In February, February 16th through 18th, 2024, at Callaway Gardens in Pine Mountain, Georgia, the topic will be the 1607 Project. In fact, it is going to be the debut of the 1607 Project. We're going to have the documentary finished. We're hopefully going to have the book finished. That's also on the agenda. I can't make that promise 100%, but we're, we're working towards that. So it's going to be a great time. Information on that is available on our website. Just go to abbevilleinstitute.org and click on the events section, and you'll see information on that event. So uh, we do appreciate everyone showing up tonight. This is going to be a, a great time. And of course, this is recorded, so it will be available on YouTube once this is over. So if you want to watch it again or share it around with those who could not make it, it's a great opportunity to let people know about the Abbeville Institute. Dr. Devaney was um, one of Clyde Wilson's students, just like me. In fact, I was the last. He was there just before me. And um, I, I, the story I always tell with, with John is that uh, when I went to South Carolina to go and interview with Clyde, I didn't meet with Clyde. I met with John and Kerry Roberts. <laughs> and then they took me to the interrogation room and put the spotlight on me and wanted to know who I was and everything. So, um, But he is a, an excellent scholar. He is, uh, of course, an expert on this particular period of time, John Randolph of Roanoke, the old Republicans, Jeffersonian political economy. It's a really great honor to have him. He's been associated with the Institute since its inception, really, in 2002. So this is a great honor for me, too. And uh, we're going to turn it over to John. If you want to ask questions and we are going to have a Q&A period, you can put it in the chat section or you can use a little Q&A button. So think about those questions while he's making his presentation. And John, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Brian, and good evening to everybody. It's good, glad that everyone's here tonight. What I'm going to do tonight is I'll not give you a really formal academic lecture, but instead we're going to just talk about some things that influenced John Randolph and then some of Randolph's ideas, some of his influences, and some of his effects on the United States. So going back into the influences on John Randolph, Randolph was born in the south side of Virginia in Colson's. And this, of course, is that area that is south of the James River. To this day, still one of the most conservative areas in the state of Virginia. And I would reckon probably throughout the Union, um, as, as it was in John Randolph's time, the hotbed of anti-federalism during Randolph's day. And the anti-federalists, at least the Virginia anti-federalists, are deeply influenced by a number of factors. One of those factors was the old country party in England. These were people that were around guys like Lord Bolingbroke, who wrote an essay called The Patriot King. Also, people like Trenchard and Gordon, who had written Cato's letters, things of this nature. And the main concern that this rather disparate group of old Whigs and country Tories had was corruption in government. They were deeply concerned about money. They were deeply concerned about buying and paying of offices and bribery. And for them, the question was, well, what mechanisms can we use to deal with this corruption in government? How do we actually get it out? And one of the solutions that they do come up with was, A, that if you do have bribery in the parliament, that you treat it harshly. In fact, Trenchard and Gordon took the view in one of their essays, I think it was number three, that you should actually hang the stock jobbers. And these would have been the brokers of the government debt at the time. The uh, Bolingbroke's view was that you had to put the majority of power into the hands of the people in the English countryside because they were independent and because they were independent and self-sufficient, they would have a little bit more resistance to bribery. They would be more patriotic minded. They weren't coming to government merely to seek rent. In other words, to seek advantages uh, through legislation for their own economic position. In England, this had very limited influence. It has enormous influence in America. Uh, Trenchard and Gordon probably was on as many library bookshelves and all the inventories that they've done of libraries as the Bible, probably the most read book. In fact, it was far more read than Locke was. 
uh, in the colonies at the time. This was true of Virginia. And Virginians had a particular affinity for Bolingbroke as well. This was true of John Randolph. He has these folks in his library. He absorbed much of Bolingbroke's work. And Bolingbroke and Trenchard and Gordon are even part of a larger movement that goes all the way back into the 1600s, a movement known as the Commonwealth Men, who begin to talk about the necessity of having Republican features in England as a way to promote civic virtue, public virtues, and to combat corruption in government. Because one of the things that is happening right now in that six, in the 1600s and 1700s is a very strong rise of a commercial order. England is building an overseas commercial empire. Money is streaming in. And even early in the 1500s, if you read The Merchant of Venice, what's interesting that Shakespeare already in the 1500s is concerned about money and contracts and how they may be undermining the social order and the ethical order. Even St. Thomas More in his book, Copia, is addressing this as well. By the time you get to the 16 and 1700s, it's far more advanced and, and there's really deep concerns. So in Randolph's family, when they come to America, Henry Randolph is the first one. He convinces his brother William to come over later. You know, William of Turkey Island. William goes ahead and sets up a plantation, and the Randolphs become one of the most powerful and prolific families throughout. They marry into the Bland family, who are also descended from Pocahontas. If you know anything about Southerners, so many of them love to claim Indian blood. It gives them blood title to the land. And so the, the Randolphs have, and if you look at any of the pictures of John Randolph, the portraiture, and look at the eyes of Pocahontas and the few portraits that exist of hers, you, you can see the resemblance that's actually there. So the Randolphs are about as Virginian as you could get, going to the native folks as well as their connections throughout. One of the French visitors to Virginia at the time was writing back home to his people and saying, one hears of nothing but Randolph, Randolph, Randolph when one visits Virginia. So this is a very prominent family politics, uh, Peyton Randolph, Edmund Randolph. These folks play an enormous role in the founding of the country and the constitution and all these types. So Randolph has a huge legacy to live up to. The most important relationship for Randolph most likely was his mother. Um, his mother, his father had died early. And his mother remarried St. George Tucker, a prominent lawyer and planter from the West Indies. But he was extraordinarily close with his mother. And to sum up the bedrock of Randolph's social philosophy, he recounts a story where his mother takes him across the plantation that would later be his down in Charlotte County. And they're riding over the thousand acres or so. And she turns to him and says, Johnny, you must keep your land. Never sell your land. You keep your land and your land will keep you. And this, of course, is the great agrarian teaching, you know, that, that is always in place. You know, keep your land, your land will keep you. Now, what's really interesting for Randolph then, from this point on, this teaching with his mother, he embraces this agrarian cause. He, he has his little curious youthful flirtations with the French Revolution. He plays around with rights of man philosophy, but we all kind of return back to the teachings of our mothers and fathers. And with Randolph, this was the same as well. And for Randolph in his early political career, the defining moment was, of course, the Alien and Sedition Acts, which horrified most Virginians and deeply horrified those Virginians who lived in the South Side. So for Randolph, one of his touchstones would always be the principles of 1798, by which he meant the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. The states had the right, indeed the duty, to interpose themselves between an overarching tyrannical federal government and the people of those states in those particular times. So for Randolph then, what kind of society does he live in? And it's an interesting society. It's gone now for the most part. You might find echoes of it here and there in the rural South. But it's a society that places a very high value in the spoken word. Uh, county court days are really important, as were elections. There were huge social events with dances, barbecues, entertainment. And a lot of that entertainment was the speeches. And these speeches are extemporaneous. Randolph, in his first campaign, will actually speak out against Patrick Henry, who, in his dotage, has become a Federalist. And he does very well. Um, so well at one point that Henry goes up to him after Randolph's speech and says, you call me father, so I have something to say to you, my son, that if you keep truth, you will learn to think differently. Of course, Randolph did not learn to think differently. But I want to point out that incident for this reason. Virginia is a family. 
many of these people are related to each other by blood and by kinship, by marriages and things of this nature. But there is this idea of the extended patriarchal family. Randolph would write one time about the South Side that when he returns home, he always remembers the times in which he looked up to the political leaders of the community as father is the uh, the elders for whom he must listen. He said, now I have become them. They are gone. They've gone to their graves. I am, you know, I am now um, those people. And so I look upon my constituents, not merely as constituents or clients. I look upon them as my children. And that very important relationship binds the South Side. Randolph would only lose one election, and that was due to his opposition to the war. So in terms of policies, where does Randolph stand on the issues of the day during his period in the Congress, which would last from Jeffersonian supremacy in 1800, all the way to his stint in the Senate and then uh, to the late 1820s. Economically, Randolph had a view that he was essentially a classical liberal. He favored low tariff legislation. He favored very small government. He didn't, he opposed the standing army in peacetime. He really believed in retrenchment and bringing government services to a very bare minimum, just to meet the needs as expressed in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. And the reason he did is that, alike, a lot of these folks influenced um, by these people, uh, the Anti-Federalists, the Country Party, and others, he strongly believed that a strong executive branch was a threat to liberty, that the standing army was a threat to liberty. And, and Bolingbroke understood this, and Randolph fights again. And that is that if you have a large standing army, you're going to have lobbies. You're going to have an industrial complex that indeed there will be this cozy relationship between um, large corporations and the government, and folks giving favors and sending favors back and forth. The thing that is very interesting uh, about all of this is that Randolph himself um, may have coined the term lobbyist. Because he would always talk about one cannot cross the lobby into the house without running into some uh, contractor, some job, stock job, or somebody seeking a favor. Congress. So for Randolph, he sees in his education from Bolingbroke and the Country Party, he sees the very things that these people were warning against. And because of those things, he was, he was adamantly opposed to them. Also, Randolph hated corruption of any kind. And in the United States at the time, uh, land fraud and real estate fraud was a huge source of corruption. One of the reasons he broke with the Jefferson administration was because um, during the Yazoo land fraud in Georgia, the administration was willing to go ahead and let fraudulent first transactions stand meaning a lot of innocent people lose their money and then recognize the titles of the second transactions that were taking place. And he excoriated this to the end. The view was, if you make these kinds of compromises, you're going to continue to make these compromises again. So in domestic policy, it was a small government, it was economy, or better yet, let me give you a quote from one of his speeches. Speaking during the War of 1812, he was reminding members of the Republican Party what their principles were. Love of peace, hatred of offensive war, a dread and loathing of public excises, taxes, and debts, dread of a standing army, jealousy, argosized jealousy for the patronage of the president, and finally that he also believed strongly in tenderness for the liberties of the citizen. So you can see why many libertarians, for instance, find in Randolph something of a hero. In terms of foreign policy, Randolph's view was typically Jeffersonian, using commercial reciprocity to encourage trade relationships and cultural contacts with as many countries as possible, but under no circumstances getting involved in entangling alliances, being very careful about moving into war. And war was not just a case of national security for Randolph. He understood that the problem with war is that it could change the fundamental constitution of a nation, not just its written constitution, but the unwritten social bonds that held the country together. And indeed, he proved prophetic in this. After the War of 1812, Calhoun would argue very strenuously. Calhoun pretty much shouldered the burden of that war in the Congress that the country needed a bank. It needed to be able to find a place to get 
funding and loans in times of emergency. The country should have a tariff as a national security policy because it could not rely on commerce without a large navy, and we need to manufacture the things that otherwise we would receive for trade. But our trading commercial fleets were very vulnerable to the British fleet. He also argued that something should be done for New England, who had suffered terribly during the war of 1812, who had flirted with the Union, and that this would be a good gesture. And Randolph's view was, well, if you make these gestures, you're not going to be able to pull them back. You will just continue down this road. Randolph had something that, you know, Thomistic scholars would call a good understanding of habituation, that once you start something and that becomes the habit, it's going to be very difficult to break that habit, break those precedents. So Randolph warned, and Calhoun later conceded that he was correct in this warning, that no, you cannot make these kinds of concessions against the Constitution. If you do these types of things, it's going to become part of that unwritten Constitution. And I would suggest that if you look at tariff levels today, if you look at our expenditures to the defense contractors, if you would look at the power of lobbyists, regulatory capture with big pharma and any number of folks, big agriculture, the man's right. I mean, the man is right. Um, Washington is very much today a revolving door. People who serve for Monsanto end up on the you know, Department of Agriculture, and then they leave the Department of Agriculture and go to Monsanto. The same as in the defense industry and elsewhere. And this was the kind of thing that Randolph feared. The government would become an engine where it would be serving aggregate capital, and aggregate capital would be encouraging the consolidation of power in Washington at that time. So Randolph, in a sense, from about 1816 until really about 1824, is going to fight this almost lone battle for a time where he is again and again in the Congress arguing against internal improvements, arguing against high tariff rates, arguing against the establishment of the bank, arguing against sending aid to the Greeks when they had rebelled against the Turks, and really keeping the Jeffersonian flame alive. Jeffersonians don't really begin to fall in behind him again until after the McCulloch versus Maryland decision. This was the decision where John Marshall decided that the state of Maryland could not tax the bank notes of the Bank of the United States, in which case he was essentially asserting the right also in Cohen versus Virginia, he asserted the same right of the Supreme Court to decide on constitutionality of state law. Randolph, once that happens, all of Virginia begins to rise up and say, this is no good. The Panic of 1819 helped as well because it hit the South very hard, and many Southerners associate the Panic of 1819 with the policies of the new Second Bank of the United States. There's an interesting letter from Jefferson, where who had many a scuffle and spat with John Randolph, where he writes, it is good to see Madison, Monroe, Randolph, and Spencer Roan, all good men, back together again, fighting these evils of federalism. And in a certain sense, the man who had been fighting them consistently throughout that period of time before he became Randolph, and he continued to do so. Um, even when you had very capable people like Henry Clay, and John C. Calhoun in the Congress, Daniel Webster in the Congress, when the John Quincy Adams administration comes into power with Clay's support, it's Randolph who, when he's in the Senate, almost single-handedly brings that administration down. One of the most clever things that he did was in his speech in the Senate, he compared uh, John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay to two disreputable characters in a novel from the 18th century, Biffle and Black George, the Puritan and the Black Lake, meaning that you know, Clay was a con man, and of course, Quincy Adams was a Puritan. Moreover, his charge was that the election of 1824, in which Quincy Adams became president, was in fact a result of a corrupt bargain between Henry Clay, who became Secretary of State, which was seen as the doorstep of the president. Uh, Randolph had stayed on the floor of the Senate. We can all spell apple pie. We all know exactly what happened. Clay will, of course, challenge him, challenge him to a duel. And this is interesting because Randolph's a good shot, and uh, this is not an easy challenge. So they, they go across the Potomac to fight their duel. Unfortunately, the dueling pistols are on hair triggers, and they both fire early. And Randolph, 
you know, missed Clay because he was trying to hit him in the leg, but missed the kneecap. He didn't want to cripple him. He just wanted to wing him. Well, Henry Clay was really trying to hit Randolph, but Randolph's a really slender guy. And he's easy to miss, and he only hits the coat at the time. On the second round, Randolph just fires in the air. And then he crosses the field and says to Henry Clay, sir, you owe me a coat. But what Randolph had probably also done was destroyed Henry Clay's chances of becoming president. Because the duel would always haunt Clay to some degree. It would always be brought up behind closed doors as his inability to keep his cool, his um, inability to not be goaded by a character like John Randolph, and perhaps his ambition gets too much the best of him in this situation. Randolph, when he was buried, said, please bury me facing west. Back in the day, Christians were all buried facing east, so that he would meet the risen Lord. He wanted to be buried facing west so that he could keep an eye on Henry Clay. Our boy was also Randolph, a major supporter of Andrew Jackson. It was very important in Jackson winning Virginia support at the time. And during the nullification crisis, this was rather interesting. It's something that bears more looking into. Even though Randolph is a supporter of the principles of 1798, he did not believe in nullification, even though the Kentucky Resolution clearly states that nullification is an option for the states. He simply thought that this would lead to chaos. He was far more incensed at the Force Act. And he was actually enrolling the militia in Charlotte County when the Force Act was founded by Jackson and was more than ready to march a troop down into South Carolina to defend their right to be free from any kind of federal coercion mm -hmm. at the time. Our guy would die up north in all places in Philadelphia. And he would actually die in the home of an abolitionist doctor who was taking care of him. And his last words were remorse, remorse. And some have always linked this to Randolph and slavery, but it, it's doubtful. Randolph's view was that slavery is a great evil, but we're stuck with it. He was one of the few planters of Virginia who actually had the money and resources to provide land and supplies for his slaves, who he manumitted in his will, and then sent them to Ohio to live. And <laughs> two times they were thrown out of the state by the good abolitionist citizens of Ohio. But eventually they did settle in a number of communities there, uh, which still do exist to this day, and at least the ruins of one community, Rossville, is still in place. But his legacy as we go forward is very simple. Randolph, it seems to me, this major legacy is that he was the great prophet of Southern politicians. He had a very keen idea as to where the trends would go. He also understood that the grave problem with the Union, and it's a problem that Calhoun would wrestle with, quite as much too. So that the way the union was set up, the constitution was set up, it would be too easy for a majority to oppress the minority section. And in the case of the South, who was paying most of the federal revenues through the tariff, it would be too tempting to go ahead and take those revenues and build the North's infrastructure up, its industry up, using high protective tariffs, and then essentially sell Northern products at a premium because they would simply outcompete and be less expensive than the products from overseas that had the tariff upon them. Randolph understood that that kind of exploitation could occur, and he was very deeply upset about this. He also understood the volatility of the slavery issue, and that the slavery issue was something of a humbug. It was used to try to coalesce otherwise disparate groups, northern politicians, into a solid block. Because at the end of the day, let's be honest, um, Bickering about money and budgets and tariff schedules and rates and things of this nature is boring. However, something like slavery, now you can have some fights. And he understood very clearly that the South had to coalesce over issues. For Randolph, it was like the issue is going to have to be slavery. We're too divided on too many things, and this should be where we draw the line. That we have certain rights in the Constitution regarding slavery, and therefore that's where we should coalesce. One can argue that this was not the best strategy um, in the long run. Ultimately, you're going to lose the propaganda war and you're going to lose some of the moral war. But it was a strategy that did work in terms of ultimately coalescing. Uh, by the time the John Brown movement gets moving and Northern support was stronger than many Southern moderates expected for Brown, it did move enough moderates towards Randolph's position that, oh, there really is a danger here uh, being in this position. 
Um, Randolph today, how does he exist? Well, you know, other than the prophet, I think the other thing that Randolph can give us is this idea of we always have to stay in touch with origins. That the origins that I haven't mentioned, which are very deep important, Brian had mentioned the 1609 project, go back to Virginia. Virginia was self-governing almost from the beginning. Virginia had always suspected a strong executive, whether it was the governor or the king. Virginia was very strongly attached to a legislative supremacy. And these were all things that Randolph would fight for and would hold dear because they were part of the soil of Virginia and part of its lived historical experience, confirmed by the country party and then confirmed by his experiences in Congress over a very long and illustrious career. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, John. That was excellent. And I know that uh, I, they, they can't ask you that they have to go through me. So I'm the gatekeeper. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the person gotcha. who say no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, that was great. Um, a couple of people were saying it was a little bit quiet. So if you don't mind just speaking up a little bit when you, when oh, you answer I'm the sorry. question, their, your audio was a little bit in and out. No, I'm sorry about That's that. That's all right. Uh, but that was great. I actually want to want to start with a question that I think it's one that confuses a lot of people. When you talk about John Randolph and you brought up Calhoun, what what is the difference between Calhoun and Randolph? I, I mean, for me, the difference they're is not, they don't antagonistic. I think for me, the difference comes down to this. Calhoun is fundamentally a unionist. I look at nullification as a way to keep the union together at all costs. And even in the 1850s speech, Calhoun is making a heartfelt plea to the Northerners saying, look, it's up to you. We're powerless. We don't have anything. It's up to you to do justice by us. Randolph's view would have been, if you're not going to do justice, we're going to leave. Because he does believe in secession as a right. And his view would have been that South Carolina would have been just more justified in seceding from the Union than actually um, joining the nullification. The second thing is this, that Calhoun's Scotch-Irish. And the Scotch-Irish tradition has this strong tradition of hey, we have got to use the government to build up the frontier, to get internal improvements. And as late as 1850, Calhoun is arguing to treat the Mississippi Valley as an inland sea for large-scale internal improvements. Clay agrees with this kind of thing. This was very something shared among the frontier politicians. Randolph's having none of it, because once you go in that direction, where does the money come from? Who's going to be favored? Things of this nature. Randolph also viewed Calhoun as being kind of as extremely ambitious. And I don't know if he was correct about that, but he did have a wonderful, wonderful line in the Senate. Calhoun, who was vice president at the time, was presiding over the Senate, and he says, Mr. Speaker, because he's always pronounced, excuse me, I mean, Mr. President, which God in his infinite mercy will avert. <laughs> so he was deeply suspicious of Calhoun. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's a when you look at Kirk, and he includes both Calhoun and Randolph in his conservative mind. They're often tied together, but there really were differences between the two. And you know how does how does Randolph fit with the old Republicans? I mean, you, this this group of people, and that you brought up Jefferson's letter. Where he says we're all back. The band's back together again, opposing this <laughs> monster of the band. But um, where does was Randolph a leader of that particular faction or was he always independent? Both. Uh, it's certainly when the tertium quit or the old Republicans emerge in the first decade of the 1800s. Joseph Nicholson, the same American. Randolph is considered their leader. But, but what Randolph is, is he's a guy who takes a direction and people either follow him or don't. One way to understand Randolph, and I forget where I got this letter from. It was probably the Alderman Lager. Randolph wrote a very interesting letter to some friends that he had on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Nicholson was from Maryland. He had some Catholic planter friends in Southern Maryland. And he wrote to one of them and said, I'm most comfortable in the Tidewater regions, even though he's a South Side boy, especially here in Maryland. I'm most at home here anywhere else in Virginia. And the funny thing about Southern Maryland and the Eastern Shore is their politics are highly individualized. I mean, you just have characters, whether it's a Luther Martin, a Samuel Chase, um, whoever it may be. And in that whole Tidewater um, ethos, individuality is 
highly, highly praised and it's highly prized. I mean, you're from Delaware, of course, you get this. You know, one of the things mentioned about the Chesapeake people is they're, you know, they're vain, prideful, and arrogant, but they're forthright. They're very honest and they're gonna they're gonna tell you what they believe. They're probably of all Southerners, they probably put the least sugar on things. And um, and Randolph is very much in that tradition, I think. Um, nevertheless, as eccentric as he is, as individual as he is, he is very much a part of that community in the South Side. He's he's really one of them, and he, you know, they are part of him. Type of thing. There's this very strong social bond. Richard Weaver wrote a wonderful essay, Two Types of Individualism, where he talks about that. Yeah, of course. Also, the Eastern Shore, you've got Abel Upshur, Virginia, yes. Eastern Shore. So you have some great characters that come out of the Eastern Shore, and really in some ways kind of a forgotten part of southern history there and um, oh, yes. it's just a fascinating uh, south well we got some questions let me start going through them from some of the uh, listeners you kind of answered this but we'll start with it uh who would you say are John randolph's biggest intellectual influences oh gosh um that's a very good question again Certainly Bolingbroke, Trenchard, and Gordon. Randolph was very well read in political economy. Um, but like most Americans, he uses political economy uh, in a very pragmatic way. So he's read Smith, he's read Jean Baptiste, he's read Ricardo and these fellows. But he he doesn't, you know, a lot of people today when they read these thinkers, they're like, I am a Smithian, I'm a Ricardian. You know, they they utterly and completely imbibe them. Randolph looks at them as possibilities for policy. He uses them in a very pragmatic way, which is not uncommon in America. Um, one of the great influences on him is the Bible. Um, he, interestingly enough, he go, undergoes a kind of a conversion. Around 1814, he's a correspondent with Francis Scott Key, who is a, kind of an evangelical Methodist. Randolph would remain an Episcopalian, but he does take up reading the Bible, and you begin to see more and more of these allusions in his speech. Um, he was a devourer of the novels of, of the 1700s and makes many allusions to the first English novelist, uh, nearly all of them. He loved um, people like Oliver Goldsmith. He read most of the old debates of the parliament. So, and whether it was um, Pitt the Younger or Pitt the Elder, um, any number of the parliamentarians, uh, there's a vast thing. There's an interesting book, and I, I recommend it with caution by Dalbadoff called The Education of John Randolph that does a pretty good job of talking about not just what influences Randolph, but also how Randolph uses books. And oftentimes he uses them in a fairly literal way as moral lessons. So I wish I could say, hey, there was these five books in the way that often is the case in the 20th century, but the man was a voracious reader and a voracious writer uh, of letters in particular. And so it, it's hard to say, but um, what a lot of think one of the things though that he is reading he's always reading through the lens of a Virginia, a Virginian uh, landowner. He's always reading through that lens, and so for him the moral lessons is important, and then the lessons of statesman. Do you have any recommendations on Bolingbroke and the Country Party? Any books on that that you could recommend to anyone? Oh, Cato's Letters with Frank and Gordon for sure. That's a good place to start, and I think the Internet Archive has copies of. The essays of Bolingbroke, in particular, um, Essay on the Paper King, which is a, a good place to start. And then once you've started there, you know, continue to feast on your journey. Um, Oliver Goldsmith, Jonathan Swift, any of their political writings and essays are, are certainly worthwhile. You brought up Sir Thomas More. I've that was fascinating to me because most people don't really realize Sir, you know, Sir Thomas More wrote Utopia. And um, when you when you mention him, um, and his discussion of political economy is often portrayed as a kind of a communist socialist manifesto, but it really wasn't. Um, more what wasn't looking at the world in that way. It was something entirely different. He's trying to distribute land, <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. But um, he's so it's it's a it's a different kind of view of um, of society and. Um, did do you know if Randolph? I mean, I'm sure he read it, but do, do, did he ever say anything about it? He doesn't. Uh, but I mentioned more in this respect. I, oh, I'm wrong. He does mention them. He has read it. 
I, and this is the problem with coming out with a list of books from Randolph. Because you actually have read just about everything under the sun. No, you are very correct about Moore. Um, Moore is not really purporting to give you the perfect society. What he's doing is using this construct that he's made as a way to criticize what he sees as the rising greed and avarice. I actually, I actually had to read that book uh, when I was in a, in a classroom a Marxist, and she looked at it in that way, uh, which <laughs> I found to be rather funny. But anyways, it's, it's great that you brought it up. Um, a follow-up question, um, why was Cato's letters so influential in colonial Virginia? Um, was it because of the society they had? Did it fit with that society? Or One reason. There's lots of reasons, but I'll give you one reason because I don't want to bore everybody with 50 reasons. Um, one major reason is because Virginia society – beginning in the 1730s, is becoming indebted. The tobacco market is beginning to collapse, and then it goes into this long, slow, bear market. Um, these guys are running up higher and higher balances with their factors in England. And one of the things that Trenchard and Gordon make a point of is that both public debt and private debt leads to enslavement. And one of the interesting things when you read Virginians on the eve of the revolution, um, being enslaved by the British government is a very real fear. And they, they don't mean it metaphorically. They mean it literally. Now, whether or not it's true or not, we don't know. Um, but certainly from their point of view, the enormous book debts that they had run up with factors in Scotland, with their factors in England, resonated with them because they're like, yeah, I mean, if we've got these debts that are eating into our wealth, we, we're part of this credit nexus, this is problematic. Secondly, English policy tends to favor keeping these credit facilities in England and limiting the amount of credit that can be available in the United States. A good example was the royal laws that were passed that would limit the amount of money that could be issued or the amount of debt that could be issued within the colonies themselves. So we often think of things, taxation, representation, and, and ideological positions, but really the one of the big arguments is money. And these people are bickering about money, credit policy, debt policy, as much as our politicians do today. That was one reason why. They, they find that it resonates there. Secondly, I think the other reason that it resonates is that they truly believe, these guys who sit in you know, Maryland General Assembly or the House of Burgesses in Virginia, that they are commonwealth men. Going back to Carolyn Robbins' book, and this, that they are Republicans with a small R in these commonwealths, and that their view is for a common good. So when they read Trenchard and Gordon, they're saying, yeah, he's talking about us. You know, we're, we are these people. We are the ones who are worried about corruption. We want to limit the powers of the royal governor. In other words, they're finding something that you could say is confirming their biases, even though I think they're good biases. Um, but yeah, it's confirming what they're already doing. There's this interesting juncture of things that get laid down in the political culture of Virginia in the 1600s and then get confirmed by certain British political writings that begin with Harrington in the 1600s all the way up through the various Commonwealth men and then, of course, into the 1700s country party. So it's almost a symbiosis of, of confirmation and assurance and nervous. One of the uh, people are asking about foreign policy quite a bit in the Q&A, and, and okay. uh, this is actually a really interesting question. Um, and it has to do with the standing army. We all know that Virginians, and really in particular, when you look at the founding generation, they were overly concerned with a standing army. And Randolph was among that, among that group. But the question is, did Randolph see a standing army as a potential threat to regionalism, to regional identity, because it would nationalize everything? And of course, we've seen that with the National Guard, uh, then, of course, the standing army today, what that does, World War II, post-World War II world. Did Randolph think about that? I know at one point, and I can never find the speech, but he talks about you know the standing army as being essentially a bunch of bummers or welfare cases. <laughs> they, they, they just go and get... <laughs> They, they take money out of the treasury. And so why should we have all these people just, uh, you know, getting, taking money out of everyone else's pocket? I mean, so was there anything, though, with identity that factored into that? No, not at that time. Um, because technically, go back to the Continental Army for a moment. 
people often say, well, our continental regulars, especially Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, did very well against the British, the militia who always run. But really, these continental regulars are just guys who were militia that signed for the duration. So you could train them longer. You, you could do a lot more with them. And, you know, the, there were some advantages. And then there were some certain cultures in that Chesapeake region that helped them fight better. I'm, I'm not going to roll into that. But, you know, Maryland in particular, in the early part of this country's history, had a, a martial reputation of the second to none of all the states at the time. The, what Randolph is really worried about is two things. He's worried about, one, it's a money sucker. The military establishment is a money sucker. Second thing he's worried about is that it can be used by the executive branch in order to enforce policy. This is why he reacts to the force act by Jackson with just apoplexy. He is extremely upset because this looks exactly like what Trenchard and Gordon are talking about. Um, so he's his view is a very typical view of most of the framers of the Constitution. We don't want a standing army in peacetime. The compromise, at least back then, is a very small military. They don't really hit regionalism. And again, even in the war between the states, all those regiments were very neutralized. You had very few, you had that little tiny standing army that fought for the Union, but the vast majority of units were regionalized. And these were people who were neighbors to each other from both sides, except for all the mercenaries from the poor towns in the north. But, you know, other than that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, all the guys that signed up to get a paycheck, you know, so uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. But yeah, I mean, I, in, until until 1900 or so, when we had, again, Congress nationalizes the militias, that was commonplace. I mean, you, you fought beside the guys in your community all the time. There was there was a certain amount of uh, respect that you had to earn by going off to fight, because if you didn't, well, the women weren't going to want to be around you. They were harder on it than the men. And uh, I mean, the men were going to drive you into the into the into the army. So um, we've we've lost that in many ways, um, certainly. Right. And these guys um, have that classical education. They they look at Rome and they they look at the succession of generals, Marius, Sulla, and the rest of them. And they're like, we don't want this. Right um, now, in terms of foreign policy, what was Randolph's position on the War of eighteen twelve? Um, was he someone who opposed it? Did he? Um, where did he fall in that in that particular war? Absolutely opposed to it. He also opposed most of the most of the commercial restrictive legislation as well, because he thought it was not in the best interest of the country. It was you know cutting off our nose to spite our face type of thing. But he opposed the war because he said all we're going to be doing is helping the Polish. Now, that turned out not to be quite correct because, again, the news cycle is very delayed over there. I mean, you've got news coming from Europe takes about six weeks to get into America at the time. So he doesn't realize that Napoleon is pretty much on the retreat and getting routed in Russia at that point, and things are not going well for him. But his view was that Napoleon was the much greater threat to the world, even to the Americas, um, than the British were. So that was his view. Secondly, Randolph's an Anglophile. He's very deeply attached to his British heritage. His family was an old Wiltshire family. Um, we believe they're royalists, uh, west of England. And uh, they have that kind of in the, the genetic baggage, so to speak. The other th problem that he had with the War of 1812 was if you go to war, how do you get out of the debt? How do you get rid of the temptation not to have a military establishment? That's the problem with wars. Uh, it's a pretty bellicose guy, by the way. I mean, he doesn't have a problem with fighting. <laughs> His problem really is that if we go down this road, we're going to end up with a military establishment that we're not going to get rid of. He's right. He's just, you know, it's going to take time. It's going to take a century. He's absolutely right. Well, of course, the other thing, the war produces the second bank. I mean, it's of the course. bank is dead. And so uh, the war makes it to where people think we need this thing. You got it. You got it. Where we have to borrow more money, exactly. and um, so it's going to create a problem there. Now, um, there you brought up uh, Weaver's essay on Randolph, and um, there's a question about Randolph and libertarianism. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is this: um, Do you see Randolph's communitarianism as incompatible with the corporate streak in many libertarians? So, libertarians, as you mentioned early on, like John Randolph, but is he? Is he really a libertarian? I mean, is there something more to Randolph that 
would mm-hmm. maybe set him aside a little bit that libertarians can find something in him. But Randolph would not ever consider himself to be a libertarian. I wrote an essay on this for a book that was published out of, I think, Wisconsin Press. Um, it's called um, Aristocrats in Democratic Times or some such thing. Basically, Randolph's view on it is this, that A, his libertarianism is best applied in two ways. One, the federal government. Keep it small, keep it constricted so it doesn't mess with states and localities. Secondly, it also had to do with the law itself. And I'll give you an example of how he did this. Um, He was against the laws that were being passed in Virginia during his life that restricted public drunkenness. And not because he was a public drunk, but more so his view was if you pass laws against public drunkenness, you're going to remove the social prohibition that are far more effective in combating that vice than any law will be because laws have to be enforced and enforcements of these kinds of social laws is very irregular. Whereas once there's a law against something, people no longer feel compelled to go to their neighbor and say, you shouldn't be doing those things. So for Randolph, who is deeply socially conservative, he is very much loves this, the existing social order, um, the patriarchy, the whole, all the things that are bad now. Um, he sees libertarianism and freedom as a way to preserve those things. He's also got this other streak that's kind of interesting. Randolph understands this intuitively. He understands that the free market is really not going to be where companies will get larger and you'll have these huge monopolies because he understands risk. And he understands that the large corporations that aggregate wealth, what they tend to do over time is they tend to use the government as a way to hedge their risk. So a good example in the recent COVID that occurred, all the pharmaceutical companies were very sure to uh, get the government to say this is an emergency medication, da 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 da, so that it could be relieved of liability. So they get these kinds of favors in these instances. And Randall's like, hey, if we have a free market, risk is going to be so high, we're not going to have to worry about aggregation as well. It's going to be too risky. So if you're really good, you might get an enterprise off the ground, but in, in order to have a monopoly, you're going to have to have a government charter. And that was actually an old-timey American view. That that's why you didn't have charters in the Constitution. It was voted down at the Constitutional Convention because charters lead to monopolies. So you have to be careful with his libertarianism. He would not agree with social libertarianism that we should have a prostitute in every corner in the neighborhood because his view would be like, no, the neighborhood would have the right to run her out of town and she would have no recourse to law. His view was it's better to let tradition and custom rule these things rather than necessarily codify them. Yeah, I think it's important to note about Randolph. He wasn't an ideologue. No. And libertarianism often tends to ideology. And so he, he um, and there was a follow-up question, you know, where a lot of libertarians think he's a proto-socialist because of his, his idea on land or the agrarian's position on land, um, which it depends on the community. I mean, that's, you have to think, as Randolph would see it, well, if the community wanted something like this, well, then that could be pursued. Um, and you're looking, we talked about more the same kind of thing um, there that could serve as a hedge against the the baneful effects of, of uh, people run into that because we think it's think in so many ways of ideology or you know there are there are certain tenets that we have to follow and uh, Randolph was more anchored in tradition as you talk about it. yeah I think that's correct I'm without a doubt and um one other Anything thing else? to add to that is uh, that oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say one other thing to add to that. Um, aside from just the tradition itself, you have to contextualize these people. I mean, uh, someone had perhaps mentioned that, the, and I guess it was the Southern agrarians made them proto socialists, what have you. Um, yes. Well, the Southern agrarians are writing in the 1920s. So they're also desperate. Um, <laughs> and many of them will come out supporting the New Deal. Uh, they're not, there's a thing that, that Vogelin talks about with symbols and ideas called differentiation, that you will have kind of this elasticity 
for this tendency to contract with both ideas and, um, and principles over time. And a lot of it has to depend on the social context. I would be kind of surprised as intellectuals in the 1920s if some of the agrarians did not flirt with large government solutions to what was called problems of the time, because that's the water that they're swimming in. Um, Randolph's not swimming in that one. I mean, he's, he's swimming in the Virginia that's been told to him of the height of Virginia in the colonial days, the country party teachings and all these things. I got a couple here that are, if you could, maybe they're a little bit rapid fire, but no, um, no. first, what was his position on the Missouri Compromise? Uh, that know. would we be one. He's, a, he's opposed to the Missouri Compromise, but the speeches are lost. <laughs> he was in a fight, and then, with, the, and uh, then the, fight is, with the clerk. <laughs> and then the other is, what is his, what is his role in the American Colonization Society? Oh, he was one of the founders, and he supported the Colonization Society for a very long time. There was a, a very strong view at the time that two races could not occupy the same land without one becoming superior to the other, or subsuming the other, and that type of thing. And, um, and it was based in history. It wasn't really based in any kind of racial ideology. But, yeah, he was a major supporter of the Colonization Society. What did um what was Randolph's relationship with with John Taylor of Caroline? Uh, were they on friendly terms? Were they uh, were they did they correspond? Friends and allies. In fact, in Randolph's view, Randolph's a good farmer himself. Uh, Caroline John Taylor of Caroline was the best farmer in the country, and um, great thinker. But as he once said about his book, The Inquiry, that it needed hells it needed was a translator, <laughs> but deep friends. <laughs> Yeah, um, they're both. That's funny, uh, you know, because Randolph is also difficult to get through at times, and so is Taylor. Um, yes. You have to carefully read them, which would make sense. Uh, but um, that's hilarious. Um, this is a good question. Why do you think John Randolph hasn't been targeted for cancellation as much as Calhoun? Um, I, I mean, you don't hear much about Randolph. I, I think primarily because he's just. People think he's really insignificant now. Calhoun has a much higher public profile than John Randolph. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, is there any other reason why perhaps Randolph has escaped the, the cancel culture and Calhoun has not? I think he died earlier before the entire sectional crisis really begins to heat up overall. Um, I don't think most Americans know history. Calhoun became a symbol. And Calhoun is dangerous because... Um, there's a lot in Calhoun that modern thinkers would be in sympathy with, particularly the idea of internal improvements and things of this nature. Calhoun has a vision for the country. He, he has a hate-love relationship with Manifest Destiny type of stuff. Um, so there's some of that in there. Uh, Randolph belongs to a different time. And the other reason is Randolph is so eccentric and so odd that it's very easy to dismiss him for his eccentricity. Can, Calhoun's not so easily dismissed. Calhoun's very logical. Um, he's very much a mod in, in Europe. They think he's our best political thinker by far. Every European I ever talked to has said, "Yeah, we think you know knows about America." Says we think that Calhoun's your outstanding political theorist. And I think this drives <clears throat> certain people in the United States up the wall. And I think it, the positive good speech has been played up so much that you know that's. And it, we live in a soundbite world. Nobody bothers to read the whole speech. <laughs> they just see the positive. Speech and Nobody well, does read the whole speech. Nobody no. ever reads the whole speech. They know one line from it. And that, exactly. And and they that, roll the line out of context. And so Calhoun becomes kind of a symbol. This, a even, even modern academic. With Patrick Henry. I mean, here they are running against each other. This is just before Henry dies, of course. And Mm -hmm. um, so what was their what was their major difference? Um, and, and Henry is an interesting character because he had essentially switched parties. That's what people describe it as. But in so many ways, I think Henry was still being consistent. Uh, there, there was a part of that. You could you can make an argument. That Henry, mm -hmm. Henry was I consistent to the end. But um, where why was there a difference between these two? That's a good question. I do, by the way, I, I mean, you'll have to check me on this. I don't think they were both running for the same office. I think um, Henry was up for some other office, but typically in those county court sessions, you would have the candidates speaking not just against each other, but 
competing against other candidates whose ideas they may disagree with. The big difference was is that John Randolph was Patrick Henry back in 1765, 66, 67, and in the 70s. And I think Henry's view was that given how the world was, he looked at the Quasi War with France. He looked at the constant commercial situations. He's a planter. He's got to move his crop overseas. He is much more amenable to a much more active and strong government. Henry is also has uh, come from Scotch Irish blood as well, and he his family was all. He's no longer on the frontier, but when his family settled where they did, that was the frontier of Virginia. And going all the way back to the late 1600s, um, folks on the frontier wanted the government to do some things wanted them to maintain law and order, civil society, and please build us a road. And, and there, there was still some of this with Henry at the time. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing is Henry, um, look, the French Revolution scared him. Plus, he didn't like Jefferson and Madison. And so if uh, yeah. there's a personal squabble, I mean, he, he if cool. Jefferson and Madison are going to like this thing, I'm going to be against it. So, and so that's important. Uh, we and forget he, about that. You, you are right. We forget about these personal squabbles and, and how they influence people. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, I mean, it's you, you can't you can't divorce that personal relationship that he had or lack of with those two men. So um, is uh, is there anything left of Randolph's plantation? Do you know? Um, not much. I don't think I, the houses were just wood frame structures. So they're long gone. The plantation still exists. There's a historical marker there. I think the oak tree under which he was originally buried might still be up. Um but I'm not absolutely sure about that. It's been a long time since I didn't been down by there. But but you can see the plantation, the marker that outlines it and what have you. Um, I think really the people who actually own the land now, some of them are the descendants from the ones who did not move to Ohio. All right. Two questions. And first, what is the best? book on John Randolph and which one would you recommend people read uh, of Randolph if they just want to get acclimated they're, they're introduced to Randolph and you say these are the things you should go to or this is the speech you should read first along mm. with this book what would you recommend I would say this I think um, there's been some good stuff written on Randolph in fact the most recent biography is very interesting but I would still say Russell Kirk's biography um, Russell Kirk's biography on John Randolph is, is still in my view the best introduction to Randolph the speech, I would say one of two speeches. It's either his speech against the war measures of 1814. Um, it's, that's an excellent speech where he lays out the principles of republicanism as Virginia understands it. The second speech would be the speech that he makes in 1824 against internal improvement. Um, this is an outstanding speech against government activism. If you want to see the personal side of Randolph, his letters to... Um, Dr. Brock and Brow um, are definitely worth, I think Kirk had actually edited those. I think that's a good introduction. There's some letters to Francis Scott Key in there as well, and it, it gives a more personal side. Randolph is an outstanding letter writer. Even literary people say that he was one of the writers of his day. Um, what would Randolph say today? I know we've talked a little bit about that. We have about a minute left. Is okay. Anything that Randolph would offer, um, and you know that goes that gets into Randolph's kind of individualism. We're all just ready to pull up the the drawbridges and say, "Let's get out of here." But Randolph was a different kind of person. Um, so, what would you say about that? What I would say, um, probably, what Randolph would do, given the political climate today, is fight. Um, you get involved um, either at the local level, the state level, what have you. That would be his instinct to do. Um, I'm not sure, though, that he would have, he would be amazed, I think, at how far things have come, at how extraordinarily powerful the federal government is, their ability to track and surveil uh, citizens at will. These types of things would be astonishing to him in many respects. But again, I mean, these are the things that he fought for. And, and secondly, those Virginians, whether it's Randolph or any of the other ones we're talking about, Madison and Rowe, all of them basically um, have a very strong commitment to public service. 
So that for them, that's the arena where you have to settle these things, where you have to defend liberty. Well, this has been a lot of fun, and the hour goes by quickly, but um, your presentation was fantastic, and I know people are recommending some of your other work uh, uh, at the Abbey Bell Institute website, Yon, and, and you've agreed, at least in in. At this point, to come on out to come on out and do our, our conference in, in Callaway Gardens and talk about the 1607 project. So hopefully you'll be able to make that and be there for the to give a talk. Um, and of course, this is recorded, um, so you can go on out there and catch it again. But John, thank you very much for your time, and I'd like to thank all the attendees for coming out and and uh, listening tonight and share around the Abbeville Institute. Let people know what we do, and and uh, we we certainly appreciate all your support, whether it's financial support or moral support, everything is uh, is necessary in this current climate that we live in. So, John, uh, again, thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to all for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Have a good evening.